Grace and peace to you in the name of Jesus, our resurrected Christ. Good morning, friends, and welcome to worship. Thanks for taking a part of your weekend to, to be here with us. Thanks for being a part of Common Grace. My name is Kyle Reynolds, and it's my joy to welcome you into worship this morning. As we uh, begin, I have a couple of announcements for you. First of all, we have a lot of small group opportunities that are rolling out next month. And so if you go to commongrace.church worship, you can see how to be a part of life groups, grace groups, disciple Bible study, all kinds of stuff. And if you're looking for a way to, to, to grow deeper in your faith, uh, th there are lots of opportunities for you to do that. I would invite you to go there, commongrace.church slash worship, check it out, see if there's something that fits your schedule and maybe fits where God is leading you to grow in the, the weeks and the months and the year ahead. Also, I wanted to say a few words about the upcoming weeks that we have together. Uh, today, our message is about celebrating together and we're celebrating uh, together our, our last morning of being an in-person worship at the Ball Conference Center. So over the next few weeks, things are gonna look a little bit different. We're going to continue to worship all online, although even the format of that is going to change over the next few weeks. And I'm really excited about that, so stay tuned for that. Um, in addition, if you're in the KC area uh, and you want to join us, we're going to have a, a celebration, a kickoff, uh, when we begin at our, our Ridgeview campus on September 12th. So that's uh, just a few weeks away, and that's when we're going to kick things off. We'll have another celebration then. And, and at that time, we're going to move our in-person worship time to 1015. So it's a little bit earlier. Uh, I'm excited about that. We'll also have a full hour of Christian education, uh, of, of um, uh, small groups for our children, uh, from the itty bitty kids all the way up through high school. That'll be at nine o'clock. Uh, we'll have opportunities for uh, adult small groups to happen on Sunday mornings as well. But I think it's going to be really great. And I'm excited about all of that. So we'll get more info about all that's coming ahead uh, over the next few weeks. Stay tuned. I'm excited to share uh, about that as we get there. But today we get to talk about celebrating together. We get to celebrate uh, what God has done over these few years, the first three years of Common Grace. Uh, and I'm so glad that you're here to be a part of it. Thanks for worshiping with us, friends. I stand. everyone. I am so glad you're joining me today because I bet a lot of you had a really busy week getting ready for school and some of you probably started school this week. When I was your age, this was my absolute most favorite time of year. I love going shopping for school supplies. The folders, the notebooks, the pens and pencils. Oh, 
You cannot forget the backpack, the lunchbox, the school clothes, right? Even now, when I'm so much older, this is the time of the year when I often get a new planner and new pens and pencils. I just love it so much. I was so bored by the end of summer, I was ready to get back to learning. And that reminds me of what we're talking about this month, which is wisdom. And wisdom is finding out what you should do and doing it. It is one of the greatest sources of wisdom we have is the Bible. Now you remember last week we looked at what happened when Solomon became king over God's people. Solomon was a young man at the time and God asked him what one thing he would want. And do you remember what Solomon answered? That's right. He said wisdom. And God made Solomon one of the wisest people in the world. In fact, Solomon's wise sayings are written down in the book of Proverbs in the Bible, and they can make us make the wise choice today and get in the habit of following God. Now, one plan we can put together from following Solomon's advice in Proverbs 22.3 is this. Wise people see danger and go to a safe place. Now that does seem pretty obvious, right? If there's danger right in front of you, you're going to go to a safe place. But this means a little bit more than that. And I have three words to help you remember this. Those are stop, think, and act. So when you're in a tough situation, you don't know what to do, stop, pause, take a breath. Stop before you'll do something that you'll regret. Next, think. Take a second and think what might happen if you do or don't do something. And then it's time to act. Remember Solomon's words? Wise people see danger and go to a safe place. Now that doesn't mean you go to a safe place like over here in the corner. It means that when you see what you could go wrong, instead of heading down that path with your actions, you make the wise choice and you do something that will allow it to come out better. Here's an example. Maybe you overheard your friends talking about the new kid at school and they're making fun of him and laughing. And at first you kind of want to join in, but then you stop and you think about how that would make you feel if you were the new kid. And so then you act and make the wise choice. You say to your friends, hey, that kid seems pretty cool. Let's ask him to hang out with us so we can get to know him. Sometimes the wise thing is harder to do than the wrong thing. But God can give us that wisdom if we remember to do what Proverbs 22.3 is telling us, and that's stop, think, and make the wise choice with your actions. Now, think, speaking of new kids in school, I have someone new that I want to introduce you to. So, Gerilyn, come on over. So, this is Gerilyn, and she is our new children's ministry coordinator. And that's just a bunch of fancy words for saying she's going to be here with us when you come back to church, and she is going to help us learn and grow in our relationship with God and knowing all about God. So, Gerilyn, I bet a lot of these kids starting school are going to start by filling out one of these Learn All About Me charts. I shared mine a couple weeks ago, and I thought it would be fun to ask you some of these questions as we get to know you. Okay. Okay, so where do you live? I live in a small town called Baser, Kansas. Oh, nice. And who are members of your family? I have my husband, Justin. I have a five-year-old, Ramey an eight-year-old Ellie, and a 15-year-old named Tristan. Oh, and what about pets? I have one dog named Luna. Okay, now what is your favorite color? Gray. Okay, and your favorite food? Sushi. Ooh, you mean like with the raw fish and everything? Yes, I like oh, fish. Oh my goodness. And what did you want to be when you grew up? I wanted to be a teacher. Well, awesome. We're so happy you're going to be teaching with us. Now tell us, what is a super cool fact about you? Uh, one time I was in a train accident. Were you hurt? No, I wasn't hurt. Okay, well, I hope that that is the last of your big train accidents. And since we're talking about wisdom, mm -hmm. what is a piece of wisdom you have learned in your life? You are free to make whatever choice you want but you are not free from the result of that choice. That is so perfect because it ties in with what we just learned about. Remember Proverbs 22.3. Stop, think about your choices, 
and act in the wise way so you don't have those consequences that are going to be bad for you or others. I am so excited for you to join us next week as we continue discussing wisdom, as we continue to know more about Gerilyn, and through the next few weeks, we're going to show you what you can look forward to when you come back to church. We'll see you next time. Yes, 
yesterday's gone It's all my sins are forgiven I have been washed by the blood I'm no stranger to the prison I've worn shackles and chains I've been freed and forgiven I'm not going back, I'll never be the same That's why I sing, oh my hope is in Jesus Thank God that yesterday Just break the man. Breaking down to his knees. God, I've been broken more than a time or two. Yes, Lord. Then he picked me up. Showed me what it needs to be. And come on and sing it with me. Thank God that yesterday's gone. Yes, all my sins are forgiven. I have been washed by the blood. Oh, my. Friends, as we continue in worship, I would invite you to take a moment to uh, take a deep breath, to center your heart, and let's go together to God in prayer. Holy and good and gracious God, we give you thanks for the promise that indeed you are our hope. We give you thanks for the promise that no matter what road we travel, you're always willing to call us back. We give you thanks for the promise of the scriptures that when we are lost, and, and God, we are lost sometimes, that you seek and search after us. And that when we are found, Lord God, that all of heaven rejoices. God, for the places that we've wandered, the places that we continue to be lost in our lives, we ask for your mercy and your forgiveness and a special experience of your grace. Would you call us out of darkness and into light? Would you call us out of brokenness and into healing? Would you call us out of division and into unity? In short, God, would you call us out of that which leads to death and into you and your way that is hope and life and light. God, we're grateful that by the power of your Holy Spirit, we can pray in confidence, trusting that you meet each one of us in the places that we are and, and that you bind us together 
across time and space in ways that, that we can't wrap our heads around, that you make us one. Thank you, God. Allow us to continue to experience that as, as the whole world experiences a new possibility, but new frustrations as well. We think about the ongoing fight with the virus. We think about the way that, that that's been discouraging and angering, frustrating and disappointing. We think about the teachers and the students who have just begun a new year that, that didn't look like what we all thought and hoped and expected a couple of months ago. God, continue to give all of those being affected in more ways than we could even name this morning by this virus to give them strength and healing and hope and possibility of all of us measures of grace and empathy and patience. And God, we ask that you would bring healing across your world. Lord God, may we be agents of healing and of peace and of reconciliation in our little parts of the world. May we share your hope with others. And may we share all that we have to celebrate with others. God, we do know that there's so much for us to give thanks for. There's so much uh, that you've brought us through. So this morning, this day, may we celebrate together. All this we ask in the name of your son, Jesus, who taught us to pray together by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Today is a big day in the life of our community together. I'm glad you're here to celebrate and be a part of it. Uh, today marks the last day of us worshiping in person at the Ball Conference Center. Uh, and so this is a, a sort of a transition from one thing to another, moving forward into the next step of our life together. But it's a, it's a time to celebrate. And that's what we're gonna talk about as we talk about moving from uh, 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 one physical location to another. Uh, and actually we're also gonna be changing some things with how we do online worship in the weeks to come. And so there's lots of change coming. And I want us to, to, to focus on what it means to celebrate. And before we talk about where it is that we're going and, and everything that's going to happen, I want to talk about what it means to celebrate, to look back, um, and most particularly this morning, to celebrate together. And so, so let me tell you a little bit about where I come uh, from when I talk about this. So I remember back when uh, my now wife and I got engaged and uh, we did sort of the, the, the telling friends and family and, and those people who were closest to us. And we went and visited family in the days right afterwards to, to share the good news in person. And then we, we announced it on social media and all of that. And, and I remember talking with her at one point about how it was like, as we told more and more more people, it became more and more real. Uh, not that anything had changed, that the commitment and the excitement and the, the, all of that that came in the moment was, was beautiful and wonderful. And yet it, it had this like greater depth uh, of reality to it. The more we, we shared it with people and got to celebrate with them and uh, dance around the kitchen and, and, and hug and do all of those things. 
And that's how it works sometimes in life, I think. Uh, good things happen or even difficult things happen and, and they don't really become real for us until we share them or tell somebody else about them or, or they have a, a greater depth to them once we've, we've shared together. And so we, we experience this in all kinds of ways in our lives. There are just certain things uh, that don't feel as real or as authentic or as full until they're fully expressed to other people. That's what we're talking about this morning. So over the last few weeks, we've been talking about the different things that summer invites us to as a season. It's a liminal space, an in-between space, and we began with three weeks on rest, uh, the invitation to recovery, uh, to restoration, and the invitation to practice for seasons where we're busier. Uh, then we moved uh, three weeks ago uh, to, to talk about celebrate. So uh, what it means to, to carry reminders with us or how life gives us reminders, and we, we do well to take note of them, to, to look back we said last week to, to find grace and to find God on the journey that we've traveled, perhaps in ways uh, that we didn't notice as we were going on the journey the first time. And today we wrap up the celebration with this third week, uh, talking about the importance of celebrating together. And friends, at its best, summer gives us lots of opportunities to do this very thing. So two weeks ago, when we, when we began talking about celebration, I told you about all the, the graduation celebrations we got to be a part of, family and friends and, and, and birthdays and, and all of that, that, that we got to celebrate, that we sort of had a backlog of. Summer invites us into those sort of experiences. We, we get together with extended families. Uh, that, that, that involves a coming together. Uh, folks find themselves in, in parks and at, at movies celebrating the 4th of July or festivals or going to, to concerts or grilling out with neighbors, all sorts of things. Festivals pop up all through the summer. Summer invites us to come together and to celebrate. I could go on with examples, but, but you know what I'm talking about. When it's time to celebrate, uh, we want to do it together. Oftentimes, the celebration draws us nearer uh, to one another, and, and that, that drawing near together, that moment where it happens, it's like, the exclamation point on the end of a sentence. So I officiated a, a wedding for a friend of mine some time ago, and I asked him later, uh, so how's it feel? It was that same week. I said, you know, you've been married for four days. How's it, how's it feel? And he said, uh, and, I, and I went back and looked at this, I wrote it down. He said, it's been good. Kind of like that feeling when somebody asks you if you feel older on your birthday, like, no. But then thinking back on it, it's a day that you realize how much you've grown. Uh, we do that with relationships. We do that in, in, a, in a, at a graduation party. We look back on everything that we've done, and it's like, it's like the exclamation point at the end that, that tells us uh, that this is worth celebrating and that, that draws to, to mind all that we've been through, that time that we come together. And by the way, I don't think this diminishes the celebration. I'm not saying it's, it's unimportant. In fact, I think it's vitally important. I think it illustrates how important it is. It makes the, the, the experience that we've been through, it makes it real. It matters so much uh, that, that we take the invitation to look back, to be grateful, to name it, to celebrate it, and to share that with other people, to, to, to share that experience so that it becomes real for us. I think that's so important. And so this week, as I was preparing for this message, I kept coming back to the same scripture over and over. And I kept trying to find a different scripture, but as I was praying and looking, like this is the one that I, I kept coming back to. It's in Luke 15. If you have a Bible, I'd invite you to turn there. And, and this is a section uh, that tells uh, about lost things being found. And so I want to set it up a little bit with the first two verses of Luke 15. Um, and uh, and I'll, I'll uh, just start with that. Now, all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to listen to Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes, they were grumbling and saying, this fellow welcomes sinners and he eats with them. So let's explain a little bit uh, of where we're at. So uh, Jesus is gathering with all sort of the outcasts. And then you have the, 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 the very religious people, the, the, the religious leaders, the, the, the ones in power, the, the ones who maintain the, the status quo and, and, and implement the religious systems, the scribes and the Pharisees, that's how Luke describes them, saying, well, what are you doing hanging out with all this riffraff? 
They are not having it. They're not interested in it. That's not what a good, upright, religious man, like a rabbi, like Jesus, that's not what he should be doing. And so they were, were not having any of it. And so um, um, Jesus sort of begins to respond to them. And we get these three parables of how Jesus uh, uh, talks about uh, why he hangs out with those people. And I want to begin by reading the second one. This is our, our primary text for this morning. So if you're following along, this is uh, verses 8 through 10. Jesus says, or what woman having 10 silver coins, if she loses one of them, does not light a lamp, sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it. When she has found it, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me for I have found the coin that I had lost. Just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So this, this whole chapter, this whole 15th chapter, tells the story of things being lost. So we have this second story of the woman who loses a coin. The first story is about a man who loses a sheep and leaves the 99 to go find them. And when he, when he finds them, he, he rejoices, the scripture says, and he comes home and he calls together his friends and neighbors and says, rejoice with me. And then we, we get the story of the lost coin, the woman who loses the coin, and then we read uh, the story of two lost sons. One of them we often call the prodigal. Uh, when the son re returns home, that the father uh, throws a party, and there's this grand celebration uh, of restoration and, and of return for his son. Jesus is talking in each one of these stories about the joy that comes when a, when a lost soul finds their way home. And really, we, we visit this text in a lot of different ways, but at its fundamental, it is about the idea of souls finding restoration and salvation, but it's also about this idea of joy and celebration. You can't understand this text. You can't understand the party that the father throws in the story of the prodigal son without understanding the joy and the elation and the celebration that comes as people gather folks together. So this morning, like I said, we're going to focus on that middle story, the woman who's lost her coin. And, and you all know, and I've said this over and over, I feel like these last few weeks, that I love, I love the imagery in the scripture where you can really um, see with your mind's eye the story that we're talking about. You can really uh, grasp it. You can envision what's going on. And that's why I love this story, particularly this middle one. It's such a, a vivid image and you can sort of see this woman. In my mind, she's a little hunched over. She's, she's older and you can sort of see her and, and kind of I can even see her facial expression when she realizes that she's lost this coin. Friends, this woman isn't wealthy, and this coin isn't worth that much. Uh, a a, a dromaca is worth uh, about a denarius, which is equivalent to a, a laborer's day of wages. So she has 10 of those, and, and she's, um, she's got a dirt-floored house, she's got a small door, and she's got no window. Uh, her small savings may even have been uh, something like a dowry, something that was intended to be a lifeline for her if ever she came to be in need. And so these, these coins actually may have been sewn into her clothes so that she didn't lose them. Like that's how important they were. Sometimes they were even shown as like jewelry, but, but, but they were always present. So you knew they were there because she relied on them. When she loses that coin, uh, she lights a lamp, something that in and of itself would, would have been... Um, sort of an occasional thing. This wasn't an everyday thing. You, you wouldn't have spent money, particularly as a, as, a, as a poorer person as she was. You wouldn't have done that all the time. So this is an investment. She, she lights a lamp, uh, this occasional luxury, and she illuminates the place and she begins to sweep. And she's probably on her hands and knees. I mean, do you see that reaching under the bed, uh, between the, the storage bins, among her food, searching and searching carefully until that moment where she finds it, she sees it and she puts her hand on it and you can see the relief that comes across her face. Let me tell you why I kept coming back to this scripture. When we talk about looking back and the things that we celebrate, uh, the, the things that we're filled with joy about and that we gather with other people for, sometimes we think about big, elaborate, ceremonious things. Uh, we think about long, challenging, arduous journeys that we've come through. 
And friends, that's good. That's good and wonderful and powerful and important. When we share those gold medal moments, uh, when, it, when, it, when it's a big deal, those, those gold co coin moments, they're, they're important. And that's awesome. But I was drawn to this scripture because it isn't a gold coin moment. I mean, if, if it was a uh, fortune, anyone would get down on their hands and knees. They would light the lamp. They would grab the broom and they would try to find it. Anybody would do that. But that's not the point of the story. The point of the story is a silver coin worth not much of anything that she goes through the work and the effort of trying to find that. Do we do that for the everyday things? Uh, what we accumulate just in a day what we carry with us day after day. Are we willing to, to light a lamp, get down on the floor, get a broom and crawl around till we find it? Most of the time we're not. So, so we've, we've come to this last day of our in-person meeting at the Ball Conference Center. And it's a big moment for sure, that's true. And I, I, don't, wanna, I don't wanna downplay it, but I also don't wanna I don't want to overplay it. I mean, common grace is moving forward. It's a change. I want to acknowledge that. I, I get that. And I'm not trying to rush us through that. But common grace is going to keep being common grace. So I don't know uh, where you're at. For some people, I think this feels very emotional that are a part of our community. And for some people, it just it feels like, OK, we're changing and we're moving. And I, I, want, to, I want to hold that tension in the room. But Common Grace is going to continue to be Common Grace even as we move forward into a new location. And so I think about all of this, and I think about this invitation to look back and celebrate. And maybe this feels like a big, momentous time for you. Maybe this feels like a giant change, or maybe it doesn't. Either way, we have this invitation to look back and celebrate. And so maybe when you look back over the last three years of Common Grace, uh, it was July. Uh, of, of three years ago that we met for the first time in a preview service. I, I still remember it was a Wednesday evening. It was blazingly hot outside and it was just an absolutely amazing night. I, I can still tell you almost every detail about that evening as if it, as if it just happened and all of it was absolutely wonderful. But, but, but so we look back on all of those months and maybe, maybe you have some gold coin moments, some big deals, a big aha that came in your family or in your faith. Uh, maybe it was uh, as a part of this community. Uh, maybe it was in a small group. Maybe it was something that was happening at the Ball Conference Center. Maybe I as a pastor had the opportunity to walk with you in, in some sort of experience like that. Maybe, maybe there was a, a big aha or something like that. There's been some impact and you can point and say that moment, I'll always remember that or that mo moment made a, a big difference. And friends, if that's your story, that is awesome. I want you to celebrate that, mind that experience, hold on to it. Uh, but, but all of us may not have that experience. That may not be true. And that doesn't mean that, that we don't have some moments, smaller moments, and we shouldn't claim them and, and name them and celebrate them. I think sometimes we need to light the lamp, to, to pull out the broom and to get down on our hands and knees for the everyday kinds of things as well. All of this is related to what we were talking about last week. When we look back on our experience and we, we, we find where we experience grace, where we experience God, where we experience possibility, where are the places that, that God has been at work? Maybe we notice them, maybe we talk about them often, maybe we haven't thought of them. Maybe it was a big aha moment, a gold coin moment, or maybe it was a small silver coin as easily discarded as, as a day of experiences that we honestly forget most of. Maybe it wasn't earth shattering. Maybe it wasn't heart stopping. And so I kept coming back to this particular passage because I wonder if we can adopt the spirit of, of the woman with 10 silver coins, if maybe we'll find that the everyday stuff in fact has tons and tons of value. And so I think about common grace and I think about the, the conversations that happened before and after service on Sunday mornings, when we shared coffee, when we had the, the tall tables out there, when we were actually able to encourage people to hang out and to, to have conversation with one another, or special Sundays that, that probably you aren't gonna include in a history book, but, but um, uh, I, I think about um, 
National Donut Day, where we had all, all of the donuts and the flavors. And I think about uh, th that and sort of just the fun that was. It was simple, it wasn't big. I think of the image of our students, um, one of them in particular, who was <laughs> only three at the time, pushing the, the moving wall, the partition in the middle of the, the conference room, like probably 18 or 20 foot tall and then pushing it along the track and how small he looks. I think about that little moment, I, I, I remember that these are the kinds of things that I'm talking about, just the silver coin everyday moments, sharing communion week after week and, and getting to be a part of that process with one another. Uh, maybe it was a, a don't, won't you be my neighbor series or, or majoring in the minors or, or embracing the uncertain. The small groups, formal and informal, the, the ones that existed, that continued, the new ones that began, the ones that have started and ended and started and ended in the time. I think about all of those. I think about our students beaming as they come out of Sunday school and then watching them go round and round and round, sometimes much to their parents' chagrin, and round and round and round the revolving door. By the way, today, that's what I'm gonna do. Last thing before I leave is take a couple of rounds uh, in the revolving door at the Ball Conference Center. These are the kinds of things that I'm talking about. The prayers we prayed uh, in a corner with, a, with a, the, a friend or a member of our community or sometimes with a stranger off the street who would come in who was struggling and going through a difficult time. I think about those, the events. I think about the Christmas tree that almost fit through the door when we had to move it into the worship space. I don't want to steal any of your memories, but these little silver coin moments, the everyday kinds of things, can we remember them? Can we find them? Can we celebrate them and can we share them? I want to say one last thing. Maybe you've had a big aha moment, a gold coin moment. Maybe you've had a lot of silver coin moments, or maybe you're brand new to the Common Grace community. Maybe you've only been a, a part of a worship online. So when I say the Ball Conference Center, that doesn't mean much of anything to you. And you think this isn't going to change much of anything for me. And that's, that's okay. Uh, there's still something here for you. How is it that, that you've experienced God through this Common Grace community? Or how is it that you've experienced God in other places, in other ways, in other communities, in, uh, digitally or, or in person over the last three years? How's God been moving in, in your experience? As you've worshiped with us online, what's that look like? Name it. Uh, where have you experienced grace through, through a, a neighbor, a friend, uh, uh, perhaps a spouse or a partner? Uh, where has that been? Share about it. And maybe it's been in this community. Maybe it was three days ago or three months ago or three years ago. Whatever it is, how is it that you've been blessed? Friends, light the lamp, get the broom, get down on the floor and dust off whatever you need. These experiences are so valuable. The invitation of this story is for us to find value in those everyday moments. But don't forget to finish the story. Don't miss the most important part. The scripture says this, when she found the coin, she calls together her friends and neighbors saying, rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. Celebrate together. Maybe you want to share right here in the comments right now. Maybe you want to call or email me this afternoon or sometime this week. I'd love to, to hear about it. Maybe you want to send me an email. Maybe you want to reach out to a friend. Whatever it is this week, don't forget the exclamation point. Don't forget the most important part. When you think about these things, about the small everyday ways that God has been moving, when you think about how God has perhaps been moving in your life through this community, name them, claim them, and then share them, celebrate them, invite others to do that. In so doing, I hope, friends, that, that, that you find a, a greater fullness in that, that, that you're able to experience it more deeply, that, that you're transformed by the experience, that, that you'll make your own joy complete and your gladness known. So reach out and connect, share with others, and make sure you celebrate together. Amen. I invite you to take a few moments for reflection.
Friends, as we continue in worship, I want to invite you into a, a time of offering. It's a chance for us to celebrate together in a different way, to take our resources and what God has entrusted to us, to, to share it uh, with what God is doing through this community and to help others experience grace uh, by doing so. I would invite you to give if you feel so led and hope that you feel blessed in the giving and know that many will be blessed as they receive it. Let's continue with this last song. the promise of grace that we're invited into, the promise of the journey that we're invited to, to follow God wherever God leads us, is that there are a million tiny moments worth celebrating, worth sharing, worth celebrating together. It doesn't mean every moment will be joy-filled. It doesn't mean everything goes exactly as we planned. But there are so many moments that we're invited to invite others into, to celebrate together, to share in our joy, and to find a deeper sense of contentment, and perhaps even find a, a unique grace in that sharing. So this week, find ways, find times, find places to celebrate together. Reach out to me, I'll celebrate with you. We are in the midst of a very exciting journey together. And I'm so grateful to have you be a part of it.
Go this week in grace and go in peace. Amen.